And as we turn now to hear from God's word, let's, let's pray. God, we pray that we would all hear your voice speaking clearly today, even though we know that in your body, you are not, in your physical body, you are not here with us today, that the the vocal cords of our Savior Jesus aren't going to be vibrating with sounds in this room today. Still, God, we pray that we would see our Savior Jesus. We pray that we would still hear His voice. We pray that we would still know His presence with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God's Word comes to us today from Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. So these are the words that the, the Apostle John uses to greet the Christians that he's sending this description of this vision he had. He says he had the vision on the Lord's Day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, we read in verse 10. So we We understand that John was worshiping God, even though he was imprisoned on the island of Patmos. He was worshiping God on Sunday, on Sunday morning. He was in worship, kind of like we were. He may have been actually alone, though, depending on what exactly those circumstances were. But he was worshiping God on a Sunday morning, and he saw this vision, and then he wrote about it to these churches. And this is the greeting that he gave those Christians he was writing to. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Uh, he, well, I'll start at verse 4, because that's where the, the sentence begins. But he says, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and then this, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. People of God, this was John's greeting for the churches that he was writing to, as I just said, and it's not only John's greeting for those churches, but it is our reality here this morning. John said, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, from the seven spirits, from the Holy Spirit, that is, and from Jesus Christ. May God give you grace. And then he says, and now to Jesus Christ be glory, and let's give him glory. That's not just John's greeting. That is our reality here this morning. God is with us. Our Lord Jesus is with us this morning, giving us grace. And we are here to give him grace glory. He's with us right here in the middle. He is the special guest in our gathering this morning. I think most of you, uh, most of you I think know know me. Uh, My family and I, we were members of this church for the last year. I've I've spent most of my adult life in Palmyra, New York uh, as a pastor in East Palmyra and then we spent a year here uh, this past year and we thank you for your hospitality of being a welcoming congregation, a place for us to land during a transition. Uh, I have just recently accepted a call from East Palmyra CRC to be the chaplain of East Palmyra Christian School and I'm thoroughly enjoying that so that's why we're not going to be around here as much anymore because we're in that community now and we've transferred as members to East Pal. And some of you, some of you may have come here and may have seen me stand up here this morning and maybe you don't know me or my family and you said, now who is this bald guy with the bow tie up in front of our church and what did you do with our pastor? And maybe you grabbed your, uh, the, the order of worship here and you were looking hoping there was a few sentence description of who I was. But I don't want you to worry about that today, because if there's a few-sentence description of a special guest that we need to pay attention to today, it is this few-sentence description of Jesus Christ. He is the special guest, and let's make sure we know who he is. Because Jesus, you see, he's, yes, we know he's here, but that but he's also invisible, right? He's here in spirit. In his body, he's up in heaven. He's ascended into heaven. He's, he's here in spirit, but that doesn't mean he's lurking in the shadows somewhere there in the corner. He is right here in the middle. He is the special guest 
this morning. Let's make sure we know who he is. And the Holy Spirit, to help us with that, brings us this description of Jesus, of our special guest this morning. This is the little bio we need to be paying attention to this morning. And there are six things that I want to go through with you today. Six things that God tells us about our Savior in this little bio. So let's, let's look through them this morning. First of all, we read that Jesus, Jesus Christ, is the faithful witness. He's the faithful witness. Now this could describe all of Jesus' ministry, everything he does, right? Uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation from Colossians. The, Jesus reveals God to us. In the book of Hebrews, we're told that in the past, God revealed himself through the prophets, but now he's revealed himself through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is a witness. He testifies to who God is, and he's faithful in this because he's God himself. His, his witness is without fail, of course. But it seems to me that with this phrase, Jesus is the faithful witness, here at the beginning of, the, of John's revelation, God is directing our attention especially to the earthly ministry of Jesus as he walked around and as he performed miracles and as he taught the time between his baptism and his crucifixion when Jesus was showing us who God was and was doing this all the way to death. Jesus is a faithful witness in all of that, testifying to the truth and doing it to death. Jesus was a martyr, we would say. In fact, that word martyr comes from the Greek word for witness. And the reason why I say I think that's what what. God directs our attention to is that that's the phrase that John uses in the next chapter to describe another man who was a martyr. When we read about read the, the message to the church in Pergamum, we read about this na- man named Antipas who was a member of that church, and John says that he was a faithful witness, using exactly the same words, and we understand by that that this man, Antipas, was a martyr. Faithful witness seems to mean specifically someone who is telling people the truth and does it all the way to death and doesn't give up. Jesus is a martyr, we're being told here. But there's an essential difference between Jesus as a martyr and every other martyr. Everyone else who's called to witness to the truth, even if it kills them. In fact, God's called all of us to witness to the truth, right? All of us are supposed to be witnesses. We're supposed to go out, if we have met Jesus Christ and we know him, we're supposed to go out and tell the world about Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be witnesses. We're supposed to be ready to give an answer about the hope that we have. We are supposed to be witnesses, and there, but there are ways you can turn up the volume on your witness. I was going to ask the people in the, the sound booth back there to slowly turn up my volume during this part of the sermon, but I've learned better than to tell people in a sound booth what to do. They know more about that than I do. So, oh, I, I, actually, I hear it's working. Okay, there are ways you could turn up the volume on your witness. I hope if some of you are Uh, Your ears are hurting, they'll turn it back down in a minute. But some of you, there are ways we can turn up the volume on our witness. One of the ways is to not only witness and, and say, hey, here's the truth, but to be willing to show that you're willing to die for the truth. You can turn up your witness, say, from level five up to level seven. But there's a way to turn it up even more. From level seven to level nine, you can turn up the volume on your witness even more if you're not just if you, if you don't just show that you are willing to die, but you actually do die for what you believe. One of the things that I'm doing at East Palmyra Christian School is uh, teaching a Reformation history class to the middle schoolers, and we studied the story of uh, Thomas Cranmer uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago. Thomas Cranmer was an arch, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he was pressured by the Catholic Queen Mary Tudor to to recant his Protestant faith uh, over a period of time, slowly signing more and more documents, taking it all back and pledging, pledging his, his allegiance to the Pope and so on. And he did this uh, because of the persecution 
that he was facing if he didn't. Because of the, the, the pleasures that he was given, the, 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 um, the, the luxuries that he was given be, as he slowly did this more and more, he was being pressured into recanting his faith. And the last step in his recantation was supposed to be him standing up in, a, in an assembly, giving a sermon in which he confessed his sins, the sins of Protestantism, essentially. And he went through the sermon and preached and confessed a number of sins. And then he got to the end and he finally broke down and took back his, his recantation of his Protestant faith and confessed that his sin was signing any of those documents at all. And he knew what was going to happen. He knew that as soon as he did that, he was going to shock the crowd. Queen Mary was, if I remember right, there in attendance. And sure enough, as soon as he did that, he was hauled off to be burned. And he actually stuck his hand in the fire first and said, this is the hand that caused me to sin by signing those documents and let it burn first as a testimony to his faith. He really turned up the volume on his witness. But Jesus turns up the volume on, on a witness in a way that none of us ever could. Jesus turns it up to 11, so to speak, and we can't go that high. Jesus didn't, you see, just die for the truth, die because he was, willing, he was unwilling to betray his witness. He was unwilling to deny the truth. Jesus is unlike every other martyr. Jesus died in order to enact the truth, to accomplish the truth, that he, was, that he had come to reveal. The word that Jesus had come to, to show us was the, the decree of God. We read one of the descriptions of this in John chapter 6, where John writes um, in the words of Jesus, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. This was what Jesus came to witness to. The decree of God to save those who put their faith in him, to save them from their sins and give them eternal life. And when Jesus died, he didn't just die because he was unwilling to deny that truth, that decree of God. He died to fulfill it. He died to make it a reality. He died to enact it. His death is the perfect, faithful witness. There's no more there's no more perfection to a faithful witness than that. In, an, in our information age, when you can go and do an internet search and get eight results from pages that you should not trust, and maybe among them there's one page that you should actually trust the answer, even if they all have the same answer, you're you look at the URLs of the, ones, the other ones and you say, well, I shouldn't trust that, and I shouldn't trust that, and I shouldn't trust that. In this kind of an age, in an age where we now have artificial intelligence chatbots that seem to be passing the Turing test and fooling people into thinking they're actually human, increasingly you and your children and your grandchildren and your neighbors are going to find themselves becoming cynical and suspicious, skeptical of anything they hear. Is anyone a faithful witness, we're going to ask? Well, we're going to ask that unless we know that the faithful witness is here with us. And he is. The faithful witness is here with us today. He's giving us grace. That's the first thing that God reveals to us about this special guest with us this morning. The first part of his bio, he is the faithful witness. Now, I know that one took quite a while. I promise the rest of them won't take that long. We, we won't be here till lunchtime. So on to the second of these six truths uh, in this bio of our special guest, Jesus Christ. So he's the faithful witness. Who else is he? He is the firstborn of the dead. And with this, it's, it's like we're moving from this first chapter of Jesus' ministry, his walking around, miracle-working, teaching ministry. We're now moving into the second phase of his ministry, his death and resurrection itself, his sacrificial death. I emphasized with the kids a few minutes ago that uh, when, we, when John says to us, and, and Paul uses the same language, that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead, the firstborn, this is not, this is not making a claim about the origin of Jesus, that he's the first creature. Rather, this is a claim about the supremacy of Jesus among his people. 
Uh, I let the oldest child in that group of siblings choose a word to write on their name tags because just as in the ancient world, today, uh, not quite as much as in the ancient world, but even today, there's a sense in which we often look to the firstborn child to see what a group of siblings is like and what a family is like. This is the way it's naturally supposed to work, right? When you're the second or third or fourth or whatever child in a group of siblings and you advance each year through school and show up in a classroom with a teacher that your sibling has had, the teacher says to you, oh, you're Stephanie's brother or sister or whatever, right? That's, you expect that. Maybe you're irritated by it, but you expect it. That's what's going to happen. And those teachers expect you to act like and to think like and to be like your older sibling. And uh, even though you might protest and say, I'm nothing like my older sibling, the teachers uh, probably are expecting the right thing. We are often like our older siblings. It's maybe not fair, but that it is the way things are. It's why it was bizarre and irritating to me when, after a few years of being an adult, I started meeting people, and they would say, using my younger brother's name, oh, you're Alex's brother. And I wanted to say back to them, no, Alex is my brother. But none of this matters when we recognize that we all belong to the one family, that through faith we belong to this one family, the family of those who are dead, right? We're dead in our sins. If the Lord Jesus doesn't return first, we're destined for death. We'll join in the grave all of those who have gone before us. We're spiritually dead. That's the way we're born unless the Holy Spirit regenerates us. We are that family, the family of the dead, but Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He's the indication of what the whole family is going to be like. He's the first fruits, to use a, a similar term, a taste of Jesus, and you taste what all of the siblings are going to be like. An offering of righteousness, right? He sanctifies the whole harvest as the first fruits. The firstborn sets the tone for what the rest of us are like. We are the dead. Jesus joined us in death. But Jesus is now the righteous and the risen one, and by his grace we join him. We will join him in his righteousness and in our own bodily resurrection. That's who's with us this morning. That's the special guest. He's the faithful witness. He's the firstborn among us, the firstborn of the dead. And now John goes on to the third description, the third part of his bio. He is the ruler of kings on earth. He is the ruler of kings on earth. And with this, we move now to another phase of Jesus' ministry, especially. Of course, he is always the ruler of the kings on earth. But now our attention is drawn especially to his ministry as the one who is ascended into heaven, reigns over us, and will return to bring his kingdom. Meditate for a minute. Just think about the fact that the ruler of the kings of the earth is with us this morning. That he's our special guest. Yes, in his body he is risen, but he is not absent from us for a moment. In fact, he's right here with us in the middle. Nobody's sitting here in these first few pews right here in the middle. Imagine the Lord Jesus is right here. Because he is. He is with us here this morning. When, with my middle school Reformation history class, we, we learned about that assembly where Thomas Cranmer confessed his sins. And as I said, if I remember right, uh, uh, bloody Queen Mary was there and, um, uh, and, we, and several other nobles were there in that church service where, where Thomas Cranmer was supposed to get up and confess his sins. He stood up in that sermon and was supposed to confess all of the things that he had, all of his unfaithfulness for rejecting the one true church. We also learned recently in that, in that class about the, the French Synod of La Rochelle where the Reformed Huguenots of France gathered in one of their many efforts to try to secure their, their freedom and, and unite together in that freedom, a, a synod where they gathered. And, and when you read about that synod where they put together their confession of faith, 
It's amazing to read the list of people. Current and future kings and queens, royalty from Spain and France and the Netherlands. I mean, there were some really important people at that synod. And I read all of this and I think, wow, the world must have been a smaller place back then. It must have been a lot easier to find yourself in a room with a king or a queen because whenever I've confessed my sins, I've never had kings or queens sitting in the audience. And when I've been to classist meetings or synod, I've never seen kings or queens or prime ministers or presidents in attendance. I thought that as I was thinking about the fact that the Lord Jesus is present with us when we gather for worship. And as I thought about those, those, um, uh, those, those meetings with Thomas Cranmer, the, the, the church service there and the Synod of La Rochelle, thought about this and then I realized, no, that's all wrong. Every time I have confessed my sins, the ruler of kings on earth has been in attendance. And every time I've been to a meeting, a church meeting, the ruler of the kings of earth has been in attendance. And he is right here with us this morning, giving us grace. He's with us this morning, giving us grace. Those are the first three things we need to know to understand who it is, who this special guest is with us this morning. Number four in this list of things we need to know about this special guest is that he loves us. In the next sentence we read this, now, to him who loves us. He loves us. And with this, I think it's best to imagine that we are now going back to that walking around, miracle-working, teaching ministry of Jesus. Go back to that because the the next two parts are going to go back once again through those three chapters of of Jesus' ministry. So I think it's best to go back and to, to think, as John writes, he loves us, to think especially about the faithful witness, going around, performing miracles, teaching In that work, he loves us. He loves us. He loves us by revealing in word and self-sacrifice the promise of God. He loves us. His faithful witness shouts the truth at, at volume level 11 so that we'll hear it and what? I think we often, we often imagine that the reason God gives us all of this is to educate us and to teach us. And that's true, of course. But John wants us to, ima- to, to notice here that the faithful witness gives us all of this, his witness, to love us. Do you experience the word of God as love? We're desperate. We're desperate to be loved, aren't we? And we come to all of the wrong conclusions about what's going to make us feel loved and be confident that we are loved. If you ask an ordinary person, what's the connection between talking and being loved, well, the ordinary person would probably look at you funny and say, I have no idea. But someone who thought about it for a while might finally say, well, if you want to feel loved, when you talk, you need to see that the people around you are actually listening to you. That if you want to be loved, being loved, when it comes to, your, comes to words, is a matter of having people hear your words and truly listen to you, of knowing that you have been heard and accepted. This I think a lot of people would say this is, this is what it would mean to be loved as a matter of talking and speech. We tell our stories and people listen and we feel loved. Now that's important. It's important that when you're talking you have people around you who are listening. But that's not what's going to finally convince you and assure you that you're loved. Not talking so that other people are listening. Nothing you say is ever going to make you feel loved in the way that you need to feel loved. Love comes not from speaking, but from hearing. 
To be loved is to be spoken to while listening, and not spoken to by just anyone, but to be spoken to by our special guest here this morning, that faithful witness. To be spoken to by the God of grace. He's with us here this morning, and the word that he speaks to you is the one that will finally assure you that you are loved. Let's give him glory. That's after all what John is saying here. To him who loves us, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's the fourth thing. So he's the faithful witness. He is the the firstborn from the dead. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth, and he's the one who loves us. He's right here with us this morning. Number five, he's freed us from our sins by his blood. Here, we're now, you can see, moving to that second phase of the ministry of Jesus, right? He's freed us from our sins by his blood. We're thinking about his death and his resurrection, and we're thinking not just about his identity, but we're beginning to think now about our identity. You see, the presence of this special guest with us here this morning, the presence of Jesus Christ, it's not just about his bio. Hey, who is this important person who's with us here this morning? His presence is about our identity. What does he do to us? Who does he make us? And we're told here that this special guest is the one who sets us free. Our name tags... The name tags that I talked about with the kids, our name tags ought to have the word dead on them. Every single one of us ought to be wearing a name tag that says dead. Because of our sins, we're destined for death. And we are dead in our sins if if the Holy Spirit does not regenerate us. And we'll join the the dead in the grave one day if, if the Lord Jesus doesn't return first. Our name tags ought to say dead. In fact, hospitals, when babies are born, they ought to give them little name tags as they head out the door. It says dead. And I don't think hospitals are going to do that. But, um, but all of us ought to be wearing a name tag that says dead because that's who we are. But Jesus sets us free from that. He comes to you and takes that name tag that says dead on you and he rips it off and says that's, that's not who you are anymore. And he puts the word that describes him, the word righteous, on a name tag. And he says, now this, this is who you are. He sets us free from our sins by his blood. That is your identity when you put your faith in our special guest this morning. Our world is going crazy with an emphasis on identity and trying to figure out who you are. You must know who you are, the world tells us. You must draw your identity out from inside of you. You'll never be happy until you've expressed your identity in total freedom and acceptance, we're told. But none of this is true because if you pull the identity out from inside of you, all you end up with is the word dead on your name tag. The only way to joy and to freedom and to confidence and to comfort is to be set free from that inner identity, to have that name tag ripped off by the Savior Jesus and to be given a new one, one with the word that he has the right to put on your name tag. He's the one who sets us free. And he's right here with us this morning, giving us grace, and we're giving him glory finally the sixth thing we get to this last one he is the one who has made us to be a kingdom priests to serve his god and father he's made us a kingdom and priests and now you can see that we're moving again into that third phase of the ministry of jesus thinking about his his ascension, his reign in heaven, and his, his one day return to bring his kingdom. And we're being told, again, not just who he is, this special guest with us this morning, but we're being told about us, what he does to us. This ruler of the kings of the earth has made us to be a kingdom and priests. He's not back there standing in the corner hiding in the shadows, lurking up in the dark ceiling somewhere, just watching what we're doing. No, he's here with his gracious presence. 
And he is changing us. Changing our identity. Yes, he's here in his spirit and not in his flesh. But even though he's invisible to our eyes, he ought to be the center of our vision this morning. Even though he is, his own voice is silent to our ears, his voice ought to be thundering in our heads. Even though our hearts, the hearts that we, and, and maybe you've gone to church your whole lives, the heart that you've come to church with uh, week after week is that same muscle that pumps blood throughout your body. Still, if you have met this Savior, he's changed your heart from stone to a heart of flesh even though you've come into this building wearing in god's eyes anyway clothes that are rags in fact they probably most of them have been made in sweatshops in southeast asia even though we've done that the lord jesus who's with us this morning has clothed us with the robes of of princes and the robes of priests he's made us to be a kingdom and priest he has utterly changed who you are if you put your faith in him and he the one who does that is right here with us this morning. He is our special guest. The Holy Spirit says this to us in the words of the Apostle Peter, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And all of this, because this Savior Jesus, this, this, this uh, faithful witness, this firstborn from the dead, this ruler of the kings of the, the earth, this one who loves us, this one who frees us, this one who makes us to be kingdoms and priests, he is right here with us. Meet him, put your faith in him, and give him glory. Let's pray. God, we pray that if there are any of us here this morning who have not met this Savior in faith, we pray that we would meet him today. God, if there are any of us here whose hearts have not been changed from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh, whose robes have not been replaced with the robes of kings and princes, uh, kings, uh, princes and, and priests, God, we pray that that may happen today by the power of your Holy Spirit. And God, for all of us who have had this experience throughout our lives, maybe long ago and again and again, this experience of turning toward you in faith, may it happen again for us, God. Help us to meet the Savior Jesus. Help us to receive that grace from him. And help us to give him glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.